people um, who have recently told me or shared stories about the fact that they decided to go and have some DNA ancestry testing done. <clears throat> um, geology, genealogy tracking has become big business for the 21st century. And many companies are charging up to $300 for you to trace your DNA to specific historical figures or ethnic groups in the past. The commercials, you know, have you seen these commercials? You know, they, they talk about people who believe that they had one ethnic background and then they discover through this testing that they were mistaken. That just seems surprising to me. You know, but then I, I came to realize when we had our Bible study uh, class um, this past fall, and we were talking about immigration, and we were studying um, uh, how immigration is uh, such a big uh, part of the Bible and is not just our world today, and how many members of the class did not know their specific family's immigration story. If we look at it in the light of the Bible, we know that that is not the problem that the Jewish people ever had. That those who come from a Jewish heritage, it is an absolutely essential element of that ancient culture that you share your story. To share the story of your forefathers and foremothers from generation to generation. And through their long and challenged past, the people of Israel held tightly to their identity that wasn't given to them by some government, that wasn't given to them uh, because of a place in which they lived, but instead it was given to them by God. And they cling on to, to this day, that ancient promise for God that for all time, they will be identified as God's people. It doesn't matter where they live. It doesn't matter how many times they lost their name. It doesn't matter about their successes or their failures. They held tightly to something called a covenant. And so exactly what is a covenant? What does it mean to us? A covenant, in a single word, is a promise. And the word covenant is one of the most important words that we will find in the Bible. Throughout the Bible, scholars will point to various times and situations in which there was set up between God and humanity an obligation. And for the Jewish people, they point to that covenant that God makes with them to give them their identity. We often look at the covenant between God and the people that starts with Abraham and then establishes them as God's people. And it moves through their history and continues. The covenant that God made with the Jewish nation is called the Old Covenant. You know, pretty makes pretty good sense, right? The Old Covenant. And then in the New Testament, God makes a promise not just with the people of Israel, but he expands that promise to include all nations and all races, to include Jews and Gentiles. And that is called the New Covenant. And in each of these times in which God makes a promise with his people, he makes that promise to extend that promise that he initially gave to the people of Israel, that promise which they pass on so well from generation to generation. And so, I began to think, I began to wonder about the covenants that we make. We, not just 
Christians, but we the people of Simply Grace. What would our life look like? And how would our church be different if we began each year or each day with really grabbing on and holding on to the promise that God makes to us for our own? Today we will begin a new series, and it's about the Wesley Covenant Prayer. The Wesley Covenant Prayer, you'll find it's, it's on the front of your bulletin as well as it's printed here, and we'll be praying it together later on. It's something that, for those of you who have sat amongst us for years, you'll know that we often begin the new year with praying this prayer. It is God's promise to, uh, to his people, but it is our accepting of that promise. And as we enter in a new way to this co uh, covenant, I ask you, Will you remove any reluctance? Will you be willing to say that all that you sing, all that you speak, all that you think, and all that you do, from this day forward, you will do for God? In the name of the one who reigns above, in the name of the one who lives forever, in the name of the one who initiates the covenant with us. We begin with the words, I am no longer mine, but thine. Will you pray with me, please? Dear God, I just ask you that your people hear the covenant you desire for them, and they are able to open their heart to say yes. Amen. I am not my own, but thine. That is how the covenant begins. Florence Nightingale, at the age of 30 years old, wrote in her diary, I am 30 years of age, the age in which Christ began his mission. Now no more childish things, now no more vain things. Lord, let me think only of your will. In the diary of Jim Elliot, a missionary who was murdered in South America by those he was trying to evangelize, and those who later his wife converted to Christ, he wrote the words, God, I pray thee, light these idle sticks of my life, Consume my life, my God, for it is thine. I seek not to long for this life any more, but one full in you. Miriam Booth, the daughter and founder of the Salvation Army, was a brilliant and cultured lady. And her ministry had begun with a promise of great success, for she was wonderfully used by the Lord. But in a short while, her health completely broke down, and she was brought to the point of near death. And a friend wrote to her one day about the tragedy of being laid aside by God, that she was being prevented to do the work of the Lord. And what Miriam said in response was, It is wonderful to do the Lord's work, but it is more wonderful and greater to do the Lord's will. At a meeting in 1756, John Wesley used a Puritan prayer as a resource to lead a prayer service. Wesley found that the service was rich and meaningful. He writes in his diary, it was an unusual time and it was a remarkable blessing. And the heart of the service focused on this covenant prayer. This prayer that requires the one who prays it to commit themselves fully to God. <coughs> I am no longer mine, but thine. 
There is a point in our life when we need all to answer the question, how are we going to live our life? Just as that each of these great people I shared about answered that question, I ask you, will you do the popular, my way kind of life, or you, will you take God's difficult way? Are you ready to fully commit yourself to God? It's not popular in our culture to give away any of our free will, to allow ourselves to be guided by anyone or thing, even God. It is often seen that if we turn over our will to one, it is a sign of weakness. We want to do things our own way and on our own terms. And so the statement, I am not my own but thine, seems outdated and unrealistic. But I ask you, and I ask myself, will I hold on to the things I want to do, or will I surrender my control to God? Am I going to trust God fully or not? Will I choose to actively seek and discern and do God's will, or will I continue to insist that I know what's best for me? The question is pretty simple. Will I give my life to God? But the answer is no easy thing to live out. Too often, I think what we think of God is, is that God is the great suggester. That God suggests that we live our life a certain way. That God suggests that we have a certain uh, path, but that we continue to hold on to the right to do things and live our life on our own. So I ask you, how's that working for you? I needed to ask myself that. How is that working for you? I needed to ask myself especially that after the past few weeks when I have felt weary and sick and overloaded. And so I ask you today, how is it with your soul? How is it with your soul? The covenant prayer points me away from my own misplaced self-confidence. And it helps me to remember that I haven't done very well trying to call all the shots in my own life. Instead, it points me to instead set myself before God. I am no longer mine, but thine. In ministry, I've come to learn that there are some people who come to this acceptance of the covenant with God because they have had some moment of spiritual enlightenment. Often it comes after a time of failure and the realization that there is no use trying to do this on our own. Sometimes it comes after a season of illness or an encounter with death. Many people who are in recovery, it is when they hit bottom that they realize that it is only God's path that will allow them to continue. And it's when we get smart and we realize that we are nothing without God. 
I've stood in this sanctuary and I've stood in funeral homes a few too many times in the last 30 days. And it is in those moments, sitting, standing beside someone's bed who is ill, sitting with parents of a child who has passed away, holding the hand of someone you love, and you have no way to write their situation, that we truly, truly understand that we and our lives are nothing without God. And so by surrendering, surrendering to God, we allow God to have complete control of our lives. And as he works in us and through us, an amazing thing happens. Because surrendering our lives to God is not just a simple, selfish choice for ourselves, but it opens up and allows God to work in and around us. And that is where God can provide the healing and life and restoration that is required in our world. A well-lived Christian life is not about what we have done, or what we have given, or what we have accomplished. Instead, it is about how much of ourselves we have fully surrendered to God. It is in the lives of those who surrender themselves completely that the world is transformed around them. The sp supreme example of this self-surrender is Jesus. For we know on the night before he died, Jesus surrenders himself in his own will to God's plan. In the scripture of Mark, it says, Father, and this is Jesus speaking, Everything is possible for you. Take away this cup from me, and yet I want your will, not mine, to be done. Jesus, God himself, but fully human, did not want to face the death and the suffering that was before him, but he was willing to surrender his own will to God's will. Jesus surrendered himself, and he prayed essentially, I am not my own, but thine. And so I ask you, when we begin this new year with that promise to our God? And I think that when you begin something new, you need to let go of what is old. And so we let us, in this time of new beginning, confess the things of our past. In your bulletin and on the screen, there is a confession. For all the things we have done wrong in the past against God and against God's people, we now ask the Lord and one another to forgive us. Lord Jesus, yours are the seasons and the ages. Give us a new heart and a new spirit. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have Jesus Christ, you are the beginning and the end. All that is, including our lives, make a new beginning with all of us. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you breathe your spirit on all of creation. Make our old world new. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. 
Have mercy on us, Lord, and let us let your forgiveness and love come down on us day after day. Lead us to everlasting life. And all of God's people say, Amen. And in that, let us pray, let us sing the prayer of great is God's faithfulness as we sing one verse of that hymn. 